Chris Maffei's wonderful tune brings us into the July edition of Post ProRes. I'm John Pollock, along with WH Park. And WH, I, I think the show just sounds better when we've got music to start things off, which we've never had prior to today's show. Yeah, it's a great tune. And, uh, you know, John, I was going to say to you, you know, that, do you know that you and I are just simply the best, John, according to Chris Maffei? <laughs> well, I will say what's simply the best is a 4th of July podcast hosted by a Canadian and uh, yourself uh, in Japan right now. So that's right. Yeah. What a, what a, a happy 4th of July to all our American listeners out there. We hope you're staying safe. And I do mean that sincerely. Yeah, I, I, I worry about the, the numbers that exist in the United States. And I and I really hope that people that I know and, and everyone in general, like, just please wear a mask. It's not that big of a deal. Don't politicize it, please. It's, it's for your health. It's for the health of other people as well. Just please wear a mask. Uh, just, you know, doing our monthly update. How are things in Numazu and have things... I mean, uh, just tell us, are they still pretty much at a standstill? Are people, um, like, are, are more businesses opening up? What's kind of the, the lay of the land over there for you? It's pretty much business as usual. You know, here now, is, things are reopened for the most part. Um, you know, I think we're, 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 we've always had a pretty good grasp on this. Like, I think we've only had one confirmed case in Namazu. I, I wear a mask when I go to the store, when I go outside, when I'm walking out in the open air and there's no one around me, I don't wear my mask. Like I keep, keep it on me, but I don't put it on. Mm -hmm. It's when I go actually around people. Okay. I'll put it on. If I go into the supermarket, I'll put it on. And, and most people are pretty cognizant about wearing masks, but in Japan, wearing a mask is not a big deal. It's like al allergy season, people wear masks, flu season, people wear masks. People, someone has a cold, they wear a mask because the idea is not to, protect yourself obviously you already you're already sick but the idea in japan is that you're protecting other people from catching whatever ailment that you might have yeah it's it, it's crazy because i used to do this weird thing whenever i i had a cold um even if i was just at home and and around family or whatever if i was about to sneeze i would put a barrier in front of my nose um to prevent anything from affecting other people i would use this thing called a kleenex and no one ever looked at me weird or thought that I'm, uh, I'm somehow negating my, my freedom as a Canadian by not spreading my germs. And it was totally acceptable and fine. Uh, other times, uh, if I was sick, I would not go to work because I might infect someone else and no one seemed to get too upset about me. But somehow in 2020, this is some kind of a debate, and I almost feel we're giving it too much oxygen because it's just a stupid debate that I think is just getting more and more amplified by people that are just I, – I don't want to say anything insulting. It's just it, – it just boggles my mind that this became a thing. It just to me is such common sense for something – during a extremely serious time that I don't think we have time for these fucking games. Well, you know, in lieu of a Kleenex, there's this wonderful natural mechanism that you have. It's called the crook of your elbow that you can sneeze into or cough into as well. <laughs> you can do that as well. <laughs> well, we have, uh, man, a tremendous amount of news to get into on this show. I think we should start off with New Japan because since we last spoke, they have relaunched and came back with the, uh, the together project. The, uh, the, their, their celebration of just being back and we're all together. And then they jumped right into the New Japan Cup and WH, you had come on Rewind to Raw and laid out your predictions. It sounded like it was going to be a hell of a couple of weeks for one Hiroki Goto, uh, which it is not exactly turned into, but nonetheless, uh, first of all, your impressions of how New Japan has handled their empty arena shows uh, as we stand uh, a week ahead of the finals where they will be going in front of fans next weekend. I think your your mileage will vary about like the empty arena setting for New Japan, but I, I think they've handled it fairly well. Um, I feel that the announcers do a great job of you know, being loud and, and showing excitement for what's happening in the ring. Um, I, I think it would have been nice to have you know, some of the, you know, staff spread throughout Corkin, you know, to kind of act as the audience as well. You see a lot of reporters in there. And like, I think the last show I watched day eight was 
you heard some noise from there, but it's been okay. Like I, I do think the quality of the matches and the, the fact that the shows are not that long, they're about two hours, and most of the matches are, you know, depending on who's in the match, but most of like the, the lesser of the New Japan Cup matches and the, the, the multi-man tags are, are fairly short, so they don't outstay their welcome. I think it's way better than what Noah's been doing, which is just so stale and sterile, and, and the matches are too long. It's like to the point where I can't watch pro wrestling noah shows anymore john like even if there's a good match it, it's a real struggle for me just to like watch a one match on a noah show because i just don't enjoy their empty arena atmosphere yeah i think it varies by by promotions and we've seen you know some creativity others that I, i'm kind of torn because some have gone for creating an atmosphere but at the same time i i am not going to fault those that are being extra cautious and not using people in the crowd and people that are not going to be deemed essential. But at the same time, you are still presenting a product for consumption. And that's going to be something that affects people's enjoyment of shows. And I, I think we've certainly seen with, with WWE and AEW that by pe- by putting people in the crowd, it enhances that atmosphere. And that's a big part of professional wrestling. But um the commentary, I, I agree with you. I think that that adds a lot to it. Uh, a certain level of urgency and drama for matches that you know th- need that that pick me up and i thought that maybe my favorite match of the new japan cup so far was that shingo takagi show match i just love that match and that was maybe the best shining example of a match that to me completely took me out of the empty arena setting and i was just engrossed in that match i i love that match oh so did i and surprising upset from show over Shinko Takagi. I, I went on record and said, oh, he's not going to beat him right now. That's a long-term story to get, but he beat him. And, you know, his subsequent match with Sonata, he looked really good. And in the multi-mans where he's in there with, other, with the heavyweights, he doesn't look like he, he's like out of place. He doesn't look like he's over, you know, outclassed or overpowered by some of the bigger wrestlers. And I think it's great. Like it, it gives me hope that like he's going to, you know, do something as a heavyweight and that they're going to push him as, a star you know not that you can't be a star in the junior heavyweight division but let's be honest it's it's new japan like there's no real you know it's no real you know upward mobility beyond becoming you know the junior heavyweight champion for a while the the real upward mobility is in the heavyweight division and i i can see show like the way he wrestles and the way he looks he, he bulks up just a little bit more he he's like you know he can have that same you know, presence and kind of like that Ishii does, who's, he's, I think he's a little bit taller than Tomohiro Ishii too. That's, you know, if, we, if we're going to go talk about like physical appearance. So our finals that we have set up for next weekend, it's going to be Kazuchika Okada and Evil, uh, a rematch of a fantastic match they had in Osaka in the 2017 G1. Also a rematch uh, that same year at King of Pro Wrestling that was not all that great. Uh, so we'll see if luck is on their side uh, next weekend. Uh, but they will have the uh, the advantage of wrestling in front of fans. And Okada went through at Ghetto in a horrendous match before defeating Yuji Nagata, Taiji Shimori, and Hiromu Takahashi en route to the finals. Evil, on the other side of the bracket, went through Satoshi Kojima, your man Hiroki Goto, Yoshihashi, and then his partner Sonata, who he just uh, murdered uh, in order to get to the final. So that is where we are. Uh, I just want some of your overall thoughts and also top matches of the tournament. Overall impressions, WH. Yeah, like for Evil, it really seems like he's really leaning in towards being a, a heel again. Like he's really being aggressive. He's using like, you know, the chair a lot. He's doing a lot of cheating. Like he's doing low blows, all this stuff. So I can see that he might be the one to win and he might be the one to get the title shot against Naito. You know, the other reason I would say that is because I don't think you should burn Okada versus Naito in a 3000 seat venue. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be Osaka Joe Hall. Um, I haven't really enjoyed either Okada or, you know, Evil's path to the finals, to be honest. Like there's their matches are not the most, haven't been the most exciting for me. For me, like Hiromu Takahashi's run, including the one with Yano, the match with Yano was, I enjoyed that for what it was. And I knew going in that it wasn't going to be any kind of five-star epic, but my guy was it entertaining. And, and I can appreciate those kinds of matches, you know, when, when they're, when they're really well done. I, I loved 
the finish because I thought, hey, I've never seen an elevator used in the finish of a wrestling match before, and and it was done logically. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, my top five matches from the tournament would be um, Tomohiro Ishii versus Hiromu Takahashi. I I love that match. I thought it was really good. Number two is Show versus Shinko Takagi. Number three is uh, Tomohiro Ishii versus Desperado, which I thought was maybe my favorite first round match uh, of the tournament. That was um, great. Then uh, uh, Minoru Suzuki versus Yuji Nagata, just, you know, the the two old guys just beating the shit out of each other and just showing that they can, they still got, you know, gas in the tank, John, and, and that they can go as hard as anyone else in in the company, really. And then finally, uh, a Sonata versus Sho, and I just really have in, been enjoying, like, Sho Tanaka in this tournament, and I, he might be my favorite wrestler right now in New Japan. Yeah, I think that th- he's had a really great tournament. I mean, you mentioned two of Ishii's matches. He also, ha- I-, I thought, c- pulled out a pretty great match with Togi Makabe that uh, at at his age, at, at this point, um, are-, are fewer and far between. Um, Ishii, um, whether it's just having the time off, um, man, he's just, I mean, even if this guy was completely broken down, I think he would have probably been up for a lot of these matches throughout this tournament. But yeah, he, he's been a big standout. And I would say that the experiment of putting the junior heavyweights in, I think everyone was somewhat leery of how will the junior heavyweights be booked. And I think that you look at how deep Hiromu went to the final four show had a breakthrough tournament in my mind. Um, and as well, I, I think, you know, him and Shingo, that to me is the most anticipated match next weekend. Mm-hmm. I think also like Taiji Shimori had a great acquitting, acquitting of himself in the tournament. Like he lost to you know, Okada, but like, I thought he looked really strong in there with Okada. I mean, the, the height difference with him, between him and Okada is, is far greater than the height difference between like Shingo Takagi and Show. But still like, I like this idea of more kind of an, an open weight, you know, kind of um, presentation to New Japan. I, I don't think it would hurt them to to kind of mix in and, and present heavyweights as junior heavyweights as, as a threat to, to heavyweight wrestlers. But beyond all of those headlines coming out of the New Japan Cup, there is one that supersedes them all. And that was the return of Hirai Kawato as the Grand Master, Master Wato, who is coming back for a top level high-end main event feud with Doki and looks to be like the reincarnation of like Blue Meanie's like 2000 character in ECW. My God, John, like I saw her. I Kawada. Okay. Okay. Kawada's back. Great. Comes in. He's wearing like the grandmaster robe. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I think it's like some playoff of like Donnie Yen's Ip Man character from those series of movies. And then he, he, he takes it off and, and my God, he's wearing like, I, I think like the pants he's wearing, they're like leftovers from like when Taguchi came back from Mexico and he was the funky weapon, but they've been dyed this, this horrible blue to match his god awful hair. And he, he's just like, he looks like a fucking dork. And can we just put a moratorium on fucking bell bottoms and wrestling, please? I'm fucking sick of them. I fucking hate these flared pants. They, they don't work anymore. Please just get rid of them. Tights. Tights are good. Anyways, and then he gets the shit kicked out of him by Dowkey. So they obviously, like, had big plans, maybe. Okay, we're going to call him Master Watto, which, like, sounds like, you know, a character from fucking Star Wars, the prequels, not not the good ones. And then and then he and, and then he gets fucking beat up by Dowkey because, like, I think what happened, John, they were like, okay, Kawato, we got this great gimmick for you. Then they took a look at him in his gear and they said, okay, you know what? You look like shit, so we're going to... We're going to fucking job you out to Dowkey. He's going to beat the shit out of you. That's, that's, it's a terrible start for the guy. Like, I feel really bad for this guy. He languished in Mexico for two years. He comes back to Japan and they saddle him with this bullshit. I don't know where they're going to go with this guy. And this, if we go back two years ago, I mean, I looked at him as, you know, a, I was a huge, huge fan of this guy. Uh, and, you know, he has been ice cold over these last two years. Like, this is not an excursion where you saw his name uh, popping up. It just seemed to be, you know, he disappeared for two years. That's essentially what it was. He had a knee injury uh, last year that he came back from. And this just to me feels exactly as it's described uh, for next Saturday's card. Third match gimmick. And he doesn't even have a profile picture here on New Japan's website. It's I, I hate the character. I hate the look. It's. 
Um, it's going to be his talent that has to overcome this and eventually shed this gimmick. I, I thought this was a really terrible uh, reintroduction and laid out to boot uh, with, with, with Doki here. I think they're going to have to go, you know, the Taguchi formula when Taguchi came back as the funky weapon. Uh, it, it wasn't really that exciting, but it, it's when he, he hit the team with, uh, with Prince Devitt, Apollo Gogo, that, okay, and then he changed his look. Taguchi became a bigger star in the junior heavyweight division. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't take as long for Kawato, but he needs an immediate makeover and maybe, you know, put him in a tag team. I think putting someone in a tag team after they come back from excursion is never a bad thing. Sure. So Saturday, they, they've released the entire card headlined by Okada and Evil, and then it's just a, a slew of tags save for uh, the, the co-main event between Master Wato and, uh, and Doki next weekend. And then we shift over to Dominion the following day on Sunday, July the 12th, where we'll have uh, Naito taking on either Okada or Evil for both championships. Tanahashi and Kota Ibushi defending the IWGP tag titles against Taichi and Zack Sabre Jr. And Shingo Takagi show in a rematch, in their rubber match, uh, with each owning a victory over the other. And I'm, I'm stoked for that match, uh, especially in front of a crowd. Oh, I, I think, you know, 3,000 people are going to be loud as hell. And, and no, definitely that show's going to sell out, John. Like, I, I don't know if you saw, like, if it came up in English wrestling Twitter, but like, Kazuchika Okada, like, kind of, uh, uh, admonished the fans for coming out to Corican Hall. Like they were waiting outside for wrestlers and he kind of was kind of tech telling them, Hey, just, you don't have to be out here. You shouldn't be out here. Don't, don't come to, you know, wait for us coming out of the building and stuff like that. And he, and people were like, you know, kind of criticizing him for why we, we we're your fans. Why can't we show our love for you and stuff like this? And, but you know, it, new Japan wrestlers have been really good about, you know, how they look at the pandemic and how they, and how they view like you know people acting entitled and the such and and i i'm totally on board with with uh you know okada being like being responsible just telling fans listen you don't have to be out here it's not necessary we we want to try to keep everyone safe blah 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 but i think it's an indication also that there's this this hunger for the new japan fans to go see their favorite wrestlers live and i can see a lot of people traveling to osaka and we talked a bit about like osaka is a really good location to draw from other parts of japan yeah i mean it's going to be interesting to see what the uh the, the volume of fans that are at these shows next week i mean it's it's not such a uh, I, i'm with you i think the sunday one i would imagine that's at capacity and saturday is an interesting test in terms of uh, the largest japanese company uh opening up their doors again if that's enough that it's going to uh fill a, as well so that's interesting to see next week. As I feel I've asked you every month, is your uh, is your hesitancy to go to a wrestling show at the same level as previous months? Or is it something that you, you might entertain over the next few months if that option is presented to you? I, I'm not interested in going to any wrestling shows right now, John. Like, you know, ask me in September, maybe. I'll see how the numbers are in Tokyo. If I go anywhere, it'll be to Tokyo. Like, but I have to see what the numbers are like there. And as well, like, I don't want to get on the bullet train, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like they, they take precautions, you know, but at the same time, it's like you can't control everything, like who's getting on, who's getting off, what if they're sick or not. So traveling to any other city by, you know, like it takes about four, four hours four to five hours to go from Numazu to, to Osaka. And then I have to take another train to get into the, the city. And then it's, you know, wherever I'm staying, I have to take a train to get to Osaka Johal. I don't want to do that much traveling in, in, on public transportation. And so, no, I'm, I'm not feeling like, you know, like comfortable going to any show right now, anywhere, like little, even in Japan, where, you know, which seemingly does a way better job of controlling the virus than a lot of part, other parts of the world. Uh, Harold May just did an interview with uh, SI.com and uh, some of the highlights uh, from that interview was talking about uh, the testing procedures that they have in place, but also noting that the G1 is currently still on the calendar for them. I mean, he did kind of couch it that they would have to uh, work with, um, you know, different government officials to make sure they, they can go ahead with it. But it sounds like the fall, that is at least the working plan is to go through with the G1. And I guess the question becomes how uh 
how how much like tickets you can sell at various venues can you open them up 100% will it be like a third capacity um it's typically you know the most profitable tour of the year for them and y- you would think just on on itself that it that might be lessened this year because of restrictions that'll be in place i i can't see it opening up fully even in japan by the fall um i i just think it's just i think you know japan takes a look at the other parts of the world and think yeah we we, we still got to be careful here also like who are they going to put in the g1 like i can't imagine it's a full g1 i got to think that like, the number of participants is is greatly reduced i i think maybe there's something to be said about if they're not going to do best of the super juniors and then use the junior heavyweights again but they might run best of the super juniors but we haven't heard any real talk about that beyond like you know the initial kind of proposal from Hiro Takahashi so maybe they'll use young lions and, and and junior heavyweights to round out the field it's it's fine but i don't i don't i wouldn't mind a reduced you know number of people in it and a reduced number of dates for the G1 and probably like a smaller like circumference that you run in as opposed to going all over the country to to run the G1 like maybe you just look at one pocket where you can go to a, a couple of different cities instead of you know sending guys on a bus all, all over the place yeah, I, I I think it's it's more likely they're going to centralize it and just have people travel to you know the Tokyo area or the the you know Kanagawa region where where Yokohama is or even Chiba area. I think that's what's most likely to happen. I I don't really see them going to like Hokkaido. I don't see them going down to Fukuoka. Maybe Osaka because it's one of their biggest markets, but that would be the extent of where I would travel to is like Osaka, maybe for like a weekend, three dates there, and then do the, and do everything back in Tokyo. Uh, one topic I just want to, to throw in there, um, just because, you know, it's been such a, an enormous one over, over the past month. Um, and specific to Will Ospreay. I mean, he's not on these shows right now. And, you know, as all these allegations have come out, he is one that was accused of p- potentially playing a role in, you know, preventing, uh, the now retired wrestler uh, Pollyanna from being booked on uh, one company shows. Do you think that that is something that is going to be uh, a cloud over Will Ospreay? Or do you think that that is something that is largely going to be put in the background whenever this guy is ready to come back uh, for New Japan? I don't think they're going to do anything about him. I don't think they care. Um, let's remember, like, you know, when Michael Elgin was having all those problems, you know, stemming from, you know, comments and allegations made against him, like, a couple of years ago, it was at the time when he was, you know, in New Japan, and they didn't care. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it, like, they, what happens in the Western world, if it doesn't make mainstream news, if it doesn't come into Japan, you know, then they don't, they don't care. Like, I can see, you know, like, they I don't think they're going to use people who've been outright fired by the WB or who, who are going to have like significant legal problems, whether it's in the United States or in, in the UK. But like Will Ospreay, you know, he's, he's really important to them. Let's, let's be, let's just be honest. Like he's really important to them. My personal feelings are like I can divorce someone's like, depending on what they've done, like what if they're a knobhead in, in real life to their wrestling, but you know, like, will I watch his matches and think, wow, I, I, I really don't like this guy or what, what, what he's been accused of? Yeah, I, I, it, it would affect my enjoyment of his matches for sure. Like, but, you know, like, do I think the company itself is going to do anything? Do I think this is going to, you know, you know, linger over his head while he when he's back in Japan? No, I don't, because I don't think, you know, New Japan cares that much unless it's a serious legal issue that something that happens either in Japan or something that would affect him coming into Japan. So that's my answer for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like his, like it's not going to end with any, like he's more so accused of, of using his power to affect, affect someone below him. Like that is what has been uh, accused of him. And I mean, he has, he has disputed it. And I think that's, that's largely where it's going to end. And that's, you know, I talked about this on, on uh, our SmackDown review with Way is that there's a lot of these different, like all these stories are, are very different and have different specifics to them. But a lot of them, it's it's not like you're just going to get some clean and tidy answer at the end of it of whether someone uh, is, you know, it's it's going to be a lot of gray area where it's kind of left on the fan to decide, like, 
however you're, you're going to feel about somebody because it's it, a lot of them are just it'll be a cloud over some and for others people are just going to either dismiss them or uh at least separate the performer from the person uh if if they're a fan of that person and and watching them wrestle uh, historically that's what happens with a lot of performers is that you know not everyone is is going to have a perfect image and it, it it's complicated for a fan to sometimes justify that yeah i mean if it was someone like on the level of like say a Legero or or travis banks like i would be vehemently opposed to it and i mm-hmm. i would hope that there's like some kind of campaign to educate like any japanese company that would possibly want to you know use any of these kinds of these talents that have been have like serious serious accusations against them so but with all with osprey you know like here's the thing john like most wrestling fans as you and i will know are, are very fickle so the, the minute he has like a five-star classic with somebody is going to be like oh my god that match was amazing we're not going to talk about like his blacklisting of the uh, of pollyanna so um, moving on to some other uh, Bushi Road no- uh, news, uh, we have uh, Carl Fredericks, who has graduated from his Young Lions status um, and-, and got a huge ceremony on on Skype with with Kevin Kelly to to move on to the next phase of his career. Uh, and unlike uh, Hirai Kawato, he's not going to have to waste two years of his life uh, going somewhere else. Uh, he's just going to skip the excursion process, and now he's allowed to have a personality. Maybe he's gonna get some uh, real gear from now on as well. That that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really excited about Carl Fredericks. I I think he's shown like his value to the company in his young line days. And I mean, the 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 sky is wide open for this guy to reach the. You know, I think I can see him reaching Jay White heights. You know, as long as he's not saddled with a a stupid character like Jay White. But you know. I, I can see this guy going very, very far. I think, you know, they're going to really play up his association with Shibata going forward as, as part of his character. And I'm, I'm all for that. Like, I, I really don't want them to saddle him with like some stupid heel character. Just make him be like Shibata's protege. He represents the LA dojo. He represents, you know, like quote unquote strong style and, and just have him be an ass kicker. And I think you can get a lot of mileage out of this guy. Maybe if, uh, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. Uh, end up back in New Japan, uh, they can get a sponsorship deal, and Fredericks can be their their young boy as Carl's Jr. John, you, you, you're really bringing my mood down just by saying the name Luke Gallows right there. You know, like, and and I I'm gonna you know I'm gonna have to emulate my uh, my fellow Asian uh, waiting and just no sell your uh, bad pun there. Uh, of of the available talent because we're getting close to where those those 90 that 90 day no compete period is up for that whole slew of talent that were let go back in april of that field uh are there you know certainly it's uh, people are expecting that anderson and gallows would probably make their way back to new japan but are there any other names that jump out at you that might be uh, once the pandemic is over and you can get these people over uh to japan that New Japan might find of interest or, or maybe even some other companies where it might be a fit. I'm looking in the direction of a Rusev, a Chris Hero, um, and Chris Hero only had a 30 day no compete clause. So, uh, realistically, he can be popping up anywhere today. Um, Rusev would be my number one choice in any company, but I think, you know, like, He's more than likely going to go to New Japan if that's if he's going to go to Japan because like I don't see him working for All Japan or or any other you know company that's basically a glorified indie. Um, Chris Hero I can see working Noah because like he has the relationship there and I think his style really suits pro wrestling Noah and I can see probably overtures already being made to him to go there. I don't think he would fit necessarily aesthetically in in New Japan. Like there is there is kind of a you know. It's kind of a body company to, to for the most part, um, but like definitely Rusev. I think Rusev would fucking kill it in New Japan because I think he's just an amazingly underutilized talent when he was in the WWE, and I think he has shown like he's not afraid to get you know get in there and and, and you know just lay it in with people and get and have things laid into him. So yeah, like Rusev would be my number my number one choice. Uh, what's the latest that's going on uh, right now? involving the whole um Hanukkah uh discussion that that's going on in Japan. I know um 
uh, Wei really kind of detailed the story on Rewind to SmackDown, but uh, her mother, uh, Kyoko, uh, spoke to a publication, uh, Shukan uh, Bunshun, and kind of outlined the role that uh, Fuji TV played in all of this in terms of her portrayal on Terrace House and also stating, you know, kind of put, putting Bushi Road on blast as well. Well, so I saw these comments uh, translated by a Twitter user by the name of Shigeo uh, at SG underscore OXXT. Follow, follow him. He's really good at translating like a lot of stuff into English for, for wrestling fans. Uh, he, he, you know, quotes her as, uh, I asked Bushiroad for a cooperation to find out the truth, but they refused. They have told me to hold memorial events and make money by selling goods. Um, after the incident, those who used her to make money ran away, ran away to avoid their responsibility. I want them to feel responsible. I strongly hope that no one will have the same experience as my daughter in the future. Uh, and then he ends her performance fee for Terrace House was 100,000 yen per month, which is roughly $1,000. Uh, even when she ate a meal with her friends for filming, she had to pay for that out of her own pocket. So, you know, when, when they're filming stuff like having dinner, you know, going out to restaurants for dinner and they're filming this, they, like, they all had to pay themselves the the participants of terrace house and not it's not a production cost which i think is just you know terrible but um yeah it, it just really makes bushy road seem really cold but at the same time like to to bushy road they they have to like work with fuji tv right mm-hmm. maybe not now but maybe in the future like they're they're not gonna do anything to rock the boat with a major network in in japan i'm sorry like that's the way they're thinking about it, I, I'm sure they would love to, you know, do more for, you know, Hannah Kimura and, and, and her mother. But at the same time, I, I don't know what else they can do. Like, it's pretty much out there that, you know, like the producers of Terrace House hold a lot of culpability in the death of Hannah Kimura and like how she was portrayed. And, I, you know, like. And, and, and according I, to her mother, a, like, you know, she went to the produ- – uh, Hana went to the producers and kind of explained, like, the toll this was having on her, which I mean, I mean, that to me is pretty unforgivable. It's one thing – like, manipulating reality television, I mean, unfortunately, that's part and parcel with how reality television is produced. But to see the toll it took on her mentally and her explaining that to them as well and they're replaying the episode and it just seemed like that was not – at least uh, according to her mother, like that did not seem to be of utmost concern to them. No, I, it just makes them look, you know, bad and, and, and rightfully so. And I, I just, every time I hear something new about this story, John, it just, just, it just kills a little bit inside me because, you know, she was so young and it is just, it just, it's just such an avoidable thing. Like she didn't have to die. Like, if if you just had a bit more fucking humanity and like common sense, you you wouldn't she wouldn't be put in a situation where you know she she felt she had to take her own life, which she didn't. You know, and it, it just just really angers me to think about it, even even like a month month removed from you know her death. It's it's just a tragic tragic story, and I mean it, it's not like a, a huge topic to all of this, but I just to to me like uh, Terrace House to me is just a a, a toxic show that it will never see the light of day again well i i'm i'm all for that like you know i i don't see how they can come back like honestly this is such mainstream news in japan still like i don't see how terrace house could or anything like remotely looking like terrace house could ever come back without like some degree of transparency and like how they put the shows together and like some you know responsibility on the producer's part to like okay we're not gonna have a repeat of this ever happening again on any future show that's like Terrace House. Shifting over to All Japan, they just held a card uh, this past Tuesday that was headlined by Suwama retaining the Triple Crown against uh, what during this period may be the most uh, under underestimated or uh, just a, a tremendous pickup in Shotaro Ashino, who's been a, a tremendous addition to All Japan's main event scene. Uh, they had a really great match here, really built around uh, the ankle work uh, by Ashino, and uh, Suwama prevails in the end, retaining the title, and this sets up a defense against Shuji Ishikawa uh, next, uh, later this month in a battle of uh, the 40-plus-year-old uh, main event main eventers in all Japan. I, could, I think this is just a placeholder title match. Um, 
until they get back into crowds. Like, I really feel that, you know, besides Ashino, that they've been really pushing Jake Lee really strong on these recent shows on All Japan TV. And he's probably going to be the title challenger for when crowds come back. And I can see them crowning Jake Lee as the new Triple Crown champion when that happens. Um, with Ashino, like, I've absolutely loved like him and the other guys, uh, Kumarashi and Yusuke Kodama, being in all Japan, they're used very well. Like the main focus, obviously, being Ashino. Like Kodama is being pushed to some degree in the junior heavyweight division, uh, and Kumarashi is just kind of the sidekick, you know, to to Ashino, you know, being his tag partner, um, not playing a significant role beyond that. Um, with Ashino, like it's been great. Like I don't know if you saw the All Japan episode, John, where like after his match, he had a tag match. He he went to confront. Suwama. So he he leaves the ring area of 2AW Square. He goes outside to get to the office area of 2AW Square. And he just like confronts him. And Yusuke Okada is there. And he's just like telling him, who the fuck are you? Why are you talking to challenging Suwama? You're nobody. You're from fucking Russell 1 doesn't even exist anymore. All this shit. is It was great. And and Ashino's like, and just, he doesn't lose his clothes. He's just like, calm down, calm down. Calm down. I'm talking to the champ, not you. And it just plays into the, the match, the tag match they would have a week later is great stuff and just the way he's been used is so so much different than the way noah has used manabu soya uh, uh seiko uh seiko yoshi yoshiki like like all these people that uh have gone from russell one into into noah like kind of floundering ashino straight to the top and i don't think him losing to swama really hurts him that much he's easily able to be rebuilt I think if he's in the Champions Carnival, which I don't see him not being, like he can, I see him going all the way to the finals, if not winning the whole thing. So for those of you who are like, why did Ashino lose? Why did he have a triple crown match in an empty arena? It's okay. Don't worry. He's going to come back. And I can see him being in that upper, upper card mix with Miyahara, you know, for the foreseeable future. Like they, they, they got a real, you know, asset on their hands in, in Shitara Ashino. Uh, so their upcoming cards, they've got a uh, July 13th at Shinkiba first ring and then show July 18th. And that's going to feature Shuji Shikawa and Suwama defending the, the tag championships against Asami Kodaka and Yuko Miyamoto. And then July 25th is the Cork and Hall show with Suwama, Shuji Ishikawa, as well as uh, Susumo Yokosuka defending the junior heavyweight championship against Koji Iwamoto. So they, they're running a fairly uh, full schedule, but I will say, the best thing involving All Japan that I've seen over the past month was an episode that WH Park sent me, which is this All Japan Dojo documentary that primarily focuses on Francesco Akira, who we've been pretty high on uh, in discussing in his role in All Japan and rising up in the their junior heavyweight division. Um, this this like forty five minute doc. Uh, I don't know if this is like an ongoing uh, series. But I, I was riveted by this. I thought it was so cool to go inside the dojo. You get to see a lot of these wrestlers in a totally different light. Uh, it features a Yumo, y- Yuma Aoyagi as the head trainer. And you get to see like the others, um, that are training alongside Francesco Akira, where it feels that, uh, Yusuke Okada seems to be like the star of the class. Uh, you've also got Dan Tamora in there and then also like cameos in there of like Kento Miyahara coming in, but just, life in the all japan dojo and what day-to-day life is like and it's it's like training and cooking that is what they do all day long yeah i mean traditionally dojo life is very uh strict john like they're they're not allowed to go out except to go buy food at the convenience store or the supermarket and they have to come back to the dojo they have to you know they have to keep the the place tidy they do their training for most of the day they do weight training they do in-ring training they eat a lot of nabe and i gonna tell you something john if we ever get to a point where we're all back in japan again we're we're gonna go to chanko nabe restaurant and we're just gonna partake in the food that sumo wrestlers and professional wrestlers eat in japan in the dojo that's my promise to you in the future um but i really i thought it was a great idea to focus on francesco because he's like this he's like our window into japanese culture into dojo culture and he's kind of relating like what's different between him training in Italy and him training in 
in Japan. And I think anyone from another country, whether it's the United States, the UK, Canada, coming into Japan would be like, tell you the same thing. It's like, yeah, this is really different from how I was trained back in my home country. Yeah, it's, um, man, like it's, it's a real insight into uh, the, the training. I mean, some of these uh, neck bridges that they're showcasing, I mean, it is like my neck hurt after watching these. I mean, it was, it was uh, uh, pretty intense to watch like their, uh, just the day to day training and the hours uh, that they go through. But I would imagine most come out of this that it is invaluable. The, the knowledge and kind of the respect that you come out, uh, for the industry from undergoing, like this is not, you know, something where you go to a wrestling class couple times a week like this is your life this is 24 7 all consuming uh you are completely all in and i think that you know a guy like francesco akira uh certainly someone to keep an eye on and see where this guy is going to progress because it's been a pretty rapid ascent that he has had over this past year uh since being showcased in all japan i think one of the things i really liked about this documentary was the fact that you know Yuma Oyagi, the head trainer, is talking about like these techniques that we're talking about, we're, we're practicing here. These come from Giant Baba. Like we, we keep his techniques alive in current All Japan. And, and just for an old time All Japan fan like myself, John, like that's really, really heartwarming to see. And like it, and it, you know, that system produced so many great wrestlers. So I don't, you know, why not keep that tradition alive in the current dojo? And hopefully maybe we'll get the new Kenna Kabashi, Mitsuharu Masawa and Toshiaki Kawada one of these days. Like, I don't know about this current crop of rookies. I like them, but I don't, I don't think, I don't see any Kawadas in the group there, but who knows down the line, maybe we'll see another, you know, reincarnation of, of the four pillars in all Japan. Uh, one can only hope. And even one of the differentiations of like the way they run the ropes in all Japan. I found that fascinating. Oh yeah. They, they use their, just their shoulder. Like most people hit their whole back on the ropes. They just hit their shoulder as I recall. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, the, that that's just like cool little things that, you know, would, you know, just to the naked eye, you probably wouldn't even notice. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing was Yusuke Okada. This guy is like pretty much helping train the, the other, the other guys. And like, there's one point where he's telling Francesco, like, listen, you're looking the wrong way when you're taking a back body drop. You're looking forward. You need to look down and show expression and, and try to show emotion of like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going so high and I'm, I'm going to crash down onto this mat on my back. And like, it's just the way. And he's not, he, you know, he's trying to talk to him in broken English, but it's great because like he's, he's conveying like his understanding of wrestling. And, and you got to look at watching him in the ring, even when he's just like seconding like Suwama or Ishikawa on the outside, John, this guy understands wrestling so well. And, and I'm really curious to see what he develops into down the line. Like Yusuke Okada is like going to be like someone to keep your eye out on in all Japan. Uh, shifting over now to Noah. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about what is going on in Noah, uh, which have, you know, a pretty, pretty expansive, uh, lineup of shows coming up over the next two months. So they announced that, uh, they're going to run the N1 Victory League, uh, tournament again from, uh, September 18th in Nagoya to, uh, October 11th in Osaka. So they have no problems scheduling like traveling around the country for this this tournament uh no have also canceled the uh november 22nd sumo hall show due to the pandemic uh ddt also canceled their show so it looks like there might not be any shows at sumo hall at all this year um you know i can't say that's a necessarily a bad idea like you know having having running a venue that big even though they're running osaka joe hall this coming weekend john like i, I still think it's uh it's not a good idea to to you know, have that many people in gathered in one place. Um, on July 19th at Korokan Hall, uh, Yohei challenges Kotaro Suzuki for the GHC Junior Heavyweight title, while Daisuke Hirata and Tadasuke challenge Yoshinari Ogawa and Hayata for the GHC Junior Heavyweight tag titles. And I, I have to be honest, John, I hate all these matches. <laughs> I have no interest in watching any of them because it involves the fucking Rattels, who I absolutely despise. Uh, moving on, uh, Noah announced nine new shows spanning throughout August and September. August 2nd, Shinkiba First Ring. August 4th, 5th uh, in Twerken Hall. August 10th in uh, Yokohama Cultural Gymnasium. 
August 20th uh, in Corican Hall, 22nd in Shiga, Shinkiba First Ring, uh, August 30th in a building called Cult Kawasaki, and September 6th in Fujisan Mese, which is about 20 minutes away from where I live, John, which I'm not going to go to. What if the Rattels are kept off that card specifically to attract you? Still not going to go. Like, and I don't think they would like. Listen, I, as much as I hate the Rattels, they are they are popular to a segment of their fan base. So, like, it would just be you know cutting off their nose to spite their face, wouldn't it? Well, another kind of interesting news story that happened uh, recently was the announcement that uh, Junakiyama is going to join a DDT, and it's being presented that he is on loan to DDT. As of July 1st, uh, they did a, a press conference uh, to announce this involving uh, Akiyama, Senshiro Takagi, and, as well as All Japan President Siyoki uh, Fukuda. So do you read this as presented that this is simply uh, Akiyama is being sent there on loan? Or do you think this is indicative of a permanent shift for Jun Akiyama, who is uh, – not not the youngest guy in the world. Uh, I don't know how many more uh, full time years he is going to have. Uh, but and, and did you find it surprising that if he's going to be loaned anywhere, it's to DDT? Um, I think it's more he's being loaned to Cyber Agent, and I can see them shifting him over to Pro Wrestling Noah, mm. which is you know somewhere that he's synonymous with as well as All Japan. Um, I'm not that surprised to be honest with you. Like you've seen him kind of like slowly but surely losing you know power in All Japan. Like he was replaced as the Booker by Chichi Shikawa at the start of the year, and like you know we can attribute like the absence of Joe Doring in All Japan uh, not, not not to the not to COVID nineteen, but to the fact that Chichi Shikawa was reportedly not a big fan of Joe Doring, whereas Akiyama was. So like with that shift in power, we saw less of you know people that were you know Aki, that Akiyama was high on like not being used as much, um, and yeah, I mean he was also like replaced as the president of all japan by siyoki fukuda so like it's not that surprising like i can see also like maybe you know cyber agent ddt is offering him guaranteed money like i don't think the the pay is as you know like you know stable in in all japan necessarily but i I can see if they made him a big offer like okay he'll take it And, and like for all japan to be part of the press conference it's you know it saves face it's not like he's jumping it's like we're, we're lowering him and then slowly but surely he's going to be integrated into ddt and i and i can totally see him be integrated back into pro wrestling noah as you know and so it doesn't and then do it slowly so it doesn't embarrass all japan that's what i see is this being kind of the bridge from all japan to noah that ddt serves and i mean that he has been been doing dates with ddt as well um yeah i think that over the next year, I think All Japan is certainly one that you put under the microscope to see because, you know, we were hearing the, the talk, like Jun Akiyama at one point, he was scheduled to go do like a week at the Performance Center this summer before everything hit. Uh, All Japan was, you know, we were seeing like they were just a few steps away from getting into bed with WWE. What is the status of that now? Is that all off the table? And what is the health of, of All Japan during this pandemic? All of these companies um, have taken a hit. It's just to to what degree um, have the have they been significantly hurt financially? Yeah, I, I think you know, like we'll see by the end of the year what the state of all Japan is if they're able to run shows in front of fans. Like how many fans are going to come to these shows, and um, like what you know what twenty twenty one is going to hold. I think I think we don't have to necessarily worry about the rest of twenty twenty. Um, I think they're probably going to run a run their schedule, and and we'll see what happens you know, in the world, in Japan, and for all Japan in the coming, you know, the coming year of 2021. So speaking of DDT itself, they have announced the the entire uh, lineup for their King of DDT tournament that's going to start August 8th and run through August 23rd. Uh, It's going to, uh, why don't you just go through some of uh, the highlights here? Is this a a tournament that jumps out at you? Because I was just saying to myself the other day, you know what, you know what we need? We need some tournaments uh, going on. Not enough, not enough tournaments to follow right now. You know, just from starting from the New Japan Cup, John, we're 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 going to be tournament heavy in Japan, and, and King of DDT starts from, like you said, August twenty eighth to the twenty third. Uh, it'll feature thirty participants, and there's going to be a battle royal called the. The, the dramatic challenge on the second day ta- on the second day between all the first round losers so all the first round losers get put in this in this 
a, a battle royal, and the winner of that gets to continue in the in the uh, in the tournament. Uh, the first fifteen round matches, uh, all of which take place on August eighth, are uh, Yuki Ueno versus Nobuhiro Shimatani, uh, Antonio Honda versus uh, Dashinuki Dino, T Hawk versus Kazuki Hirata, Makoto Oishi versus Chris Brooks, uh, Tomomitsu uh, Matanaga versus Daisuke, Daisuke Sasaki, Shinya Aoki versus uh, Yuki Ino, uh, Toru Owashi versus Seigo Tachibana, Akito versus uh, Tetsuya Endo, right side of the bracket, Yukio Sakaguchi versus uh, Shunma Katsumata, uh, Soma Takao versus Minoru Tanaka, uh, Harashima versus Mad Polly, uh, Mizuki Watase versus Kazusada. Uh, Kazusada Higuchi, uh, Yukio Naya versus El Lindemann, uh, and Naomi Yoshimura versus Konosuke Takeshida. Uh, the winner of this, of the dramatic challenge, will advance straight to the quarterfinals. <laughs> so if you lose, John, you kind of win to face either, you know, Sakaguchi, Katsumata, Takao, or Moron Tanaka. Uh, after the first full round on August 8th, the second round and dramatic challenges will take place on August 9th. The quarterfinals will be on August 10th. All these shows will take place in uh, Kanda Miojin Hall, which I've never been to. Uh, then the four semifinalists will be shuffled, and the semifinals and final will take place on August 23rd in Corken Hall. So just a very ambitious schedule for DDT. And and I don't follow DDT enough to predict a winner of, of this uh, King of DDT, DDT tournament, John. So sorry about that. Is uh, is Mad Polly a tribute gimmick uh, involving uh, a wrestler who has uh, – WWE creative for the past year under his belt and is just left running raw. I, have you ever seen what Mad Polly looks like, John? No, I have not. So, so he's a very uh, rotund individual who wears a full body suit and has a uh, kiss like face paint. So I don't think he's meant to be like a uh, one Paul Heyman. Okay. Well, that's what's going on in, uh, in, in DDT. Uh, Zero One also saw some some talent departures that uh, Tokyo Sports uh, reported on with Akuto Hadaka, Kohei Sato, and Tatsuhito Takaiwa. So three individuals that have been uh, pretty ingrained uh, with Zero One uh, leaving the promotion, and this comes at you know to our previous point about you know the state of different promotions. Uh, Zero One, there's been uh, a lot of pay cuts when it comes to wrestlers as well as staff. Yeah, I mean they took a eighty. 80- percent pay cut john like and it's not like these people were making that much money in the first place um like you know like zero one russell one looking like russell one's done zero one looks like it's done so the lesson to be learned john is that if you're starting a wrestling company in japan in this day and age don't put the word the number one at the end of your wrestling name that's number one uh yeah, I don't know. Like the other big departure was Kazuhiro Iwamoto, who was made president of the company in March, and he's already resigned his position because he probably took a look at the book and said, "I can't work with this. this is, what, what are you giving me here?" Um, I think the big the big thing is that you know they're they're losing like their sponsors and and the people who who back their companies. The, you know, for lack of a better term, the money marks who who fund uh, Zero One and like without. Any fans at their shows, they're not bringing any income to, to kind of like make a profit for their sponsors. So like what's the point? And honestly, I, I'm surprised they're still around even without the COVID, John. Like they've not been the greatest company in terms of like, you know, finances or creative you know, booking or anything like that. They have a pretty lackluster roster. There's like some good talents on there, but like for the most part, there's nothing exciting about Zero One, in my opinion, at least. But like to me, like if you take a lot of the good talent and you put them in another company, I think that's good for the industry as a whole. So like I'm not, and I don't want to see anyone lose their jobs. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, for, if I'm talking at the, the bigger picture, it's not a bad idea to have less companies and more deeper rosters in in existing companies of those three names are is there one where is there just like a a perfect relationship in your mind that you think this this opens it up for uh either one of those with with takiwa or hadaka or uh uh, any of them that you would love to see them pop up in hidaka i can see being a junior in either pro wrestling noah or in all japan uh koi sato i think is perfect for all japan or you know he has a good relationship with big japan for wrestling like he does a lot of dates for them i can see him becoming a, a kind of a full-time member there takaiwa is like an interesting you know name because like you know he's he was basically 
running the dojo for for zero one so he has that experience he's also like you know one you know one of the greatest junior heavyweights that, that was wrestling in the late 90s in in new japan's junior heavyweight division so i don't see him going back there necessarily there's a great a documentary series he could be introduced on as a as a guest trainer that that's that there you go i think i i can see him landing in like all japan as well but like i can see maybe like you know they want to strengthen up their their dojo you know their the trainers at the dojo in new japan maybe they're gonna call up to kaiwa and say hey you want to be a trainer here I, who knows i i he's the only one where i don't know exactly where he would land but koei sato daka you know like all japan big japan pro Noah, it could be any of those companies I'm glad you saved this towards the end. Uh, your favorite company, and I do put that in quotation marks during this whole pandemic, has been Big Japan. Please give us the update, uh, WH. How is how is the crowdfunding going, and how how is Big Japan uh, dealing with with everything? Because they were they were on the brink uh, a couple of months back. Uh, what's what's their health situation from your assessment? Um, well, John, recently, you know, you know, last time we talked about the uh the crowdfunding and i and i made a point of saying like if they use any of this money to buy bullshit like light tubes i'll be really angry but no john it's not it's not that they're using the the crowdfunding money to buy light tubes they're 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 asking fans to donate light tubes (laughs) on their social media and on their website like i couldn't fucking believe it how like, how do you even go like do you go down to like their their office and just put like s- light tubes in front of their office space i mean how how do you even donate a light tube in the in this current pandemic and how much are light tubes like these are we're talking about like we're not talking about like the fucking lights in your house john we're talking about like industrial sized light tubes and here's the thing i i watched a bit of the main event of uh, the last crisis survivor show that was put up on a uh, samurai tv <laughs> the main event john it's a it's a multi, it's a tag match it's a death match it's got fucking light tubes the entire ring every side of the ring the ropes are covered in light tubes there's light tubes outside on tables for people to be power bombed or slammed into there's light tubes fucking littering the ground of the the balcony area of their dojo where they're running their shows in and i'm like no wonder they're asking fans to donate light tubes because like they're using like a hundred fucking light tubes in one fucking match it's like why do you need light tubes in a, during a global pandemic why didn't you make people bleed this i fucking hate this company now like and i i, I didn't mind them i even liked them at points before you know john but it's like you do stuff like this and it's just bad faith it's just acting in bad faith. It's like our fans need to see a light tube match if they're going to watch our shows. There's no fucking fans in the audience. Who are who's who are you doing this for? The people on Samurai TV, they're going to watch it. They're going to watch the fucking show anyways for your your shit streaming service which is like 4 months out of fucking date anyways. No. Like that's where that's where it gall- galls me, John. Here's where they should be putting their efforts. Not asking their fans to donate fucking light tubes, but to make their streaming service a lot better and a lot more timely so people don't feel gypped subscribing to it. Like, I, I subscribed to it for, like, a month, and I was like, all this stuff is, like, not being updated until, like, three months later. I'm not I'm not keeping this. Fuck this shit. I'll watch New Japan a different... Well, I'll watch Big Japan a different way. But here's the thing. It's like, do we know if COVID has passed through blood? We don't. It may or may not be. It's it's droplets, right? Blood, as last time I recalled, is bodily fluids. So that's the main re- way that COVID gets spread. So why are they having blood in all these fucking matches? Like, and, and just the gall, the fucking gall. You ask these fans to give you money, and then you ask them to donate fucking light tubes. Fuck you. I, I fucking hate this shit. If they die, I don't, again, I don't want to see anyone lose their jobs, but if they die tomorrow, I won't, I won't be sad. I'll be, I'm just being honest right here. WH Park, he is not donating any light tubes to any companies. Um, but my God, I will, what, what an expense to, uh, make during this time. Um, so in lieu of any PPE, uh, light tubes, light tubes are welcome in big Japan. Uh, closing out here. Um, what would you like to say about, uh, 2AW? And we can also cover, uh, whatever's coming up with, uh, with stardom. Uh, why don't you take us through the finish here? All right, so uh, TAW is going to uh, celebrate their first anniversary on uh, today, actually. Uh, well, like this coming week, uh, July 5th at the TKP Garden City 
in Chiba, uh, Yuji Okabayashi uh, of Big Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, will defend his 2AW Openweight title against uh, 2AW star Ayato Yoshida, and the show is scheduled to air on Samurai TV on uh, July 12th. Looking forward to that. Like to me, 2AW has been one of my favorite companies to watch during this. You know, empty arena setting, John. Uh, like the Chango and Kaiju Tomato, great run as the tag team champions. Yuji Okabashi's had some really strong title offenses. So give it a watch if you're able to find these shows. Give it a watch. I, I highly recommend TW and, and Stardom return to action in front of fans at Shinkiba First Ring on June 21st. It, not, not a very momentous show. Um, but it was, it was nice to see them run shows and all the fans were asked to wear masks. And you no know, streamers allowed anymore. And I thought it was a nice, like, small, you know, small step return for stardom. And I guess that the next test will be trying to run a bigger building, like, say, Cork and Hall. Um, on also Sendai Girls, speaking on the Joshi note, uh, returns to running in front of fans on August 2nd. Uh, uh, the Yoshihiro Takayama show that happens every year, Takayama, Takayama, M- Takayama Mania Empire. Uh, which usually takes place in the August has been canceled to prevent the spread of coronavirus, which is, you know, it's a shame because it's, it's the, the proceeds from this show, John, usually go to help pay for the medical expenses of Yoshihiro Takayama. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I thought the last note I have here, which I thought was really interesting is that uh, Japan's first ever drive-in wrestling show is happening on, uh, July 11th uh, in Nagano, which I, I would I would be interested in going to that if I actually had a friend who'd be willing to drive out to Nagano with me, but I don't because Nagano's a little far from Nimazu. Well, that's uh, you know, it's it's clever ideas like that where we're starting to see like drive-in shows start to uh, to pop up uh in North in North America. I'm also kind of curious, like if any companies in Japan start to experiment with outdoor shows where you know it's you know. In theory, like there's less of a risk of spread when you're outdoors. And we start to see it like Game Changer Wrestling just did uh, an outdoor show in Indianapolis. And I, w- I wonder if that's something that especially smaller companies that are looking to run. I mean, there to me would be a lot less logistical issues running like outdoors in a park somewhere as opposed to booking a building and all that comes with that during the pandemic. Oh, I mean, it's been done, John. I mean, like, uh, zero one have <laughs> run shows in parking lots. Uh, I think Big Japan has done it as well. Like, so the idea of running shows outdoors is, is, is nothing new in, in modern J- Japanese wrestling. So yeah, I, I totally see it. I, I, I think they have to do it, you know, before October while the weather is still, you know, even though it's hot, it's like less likely to rain. Like right now we're in the midst of our rainy season. It's been waiting for like two weeks on and off straight here in Japan, John. So, well, like, Okada, we- Okada and Suzuki proved you, you can have a great match in the rain as well. This is true. It's not so great for the fans, but it, 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 it's great for watching it on television. Um, but yeah, I, I, I totally see outdoor shows being a thing during the summer and the fall um, going forward. And yeah, I, I but I, I really I really like this drive in idea, John. I, I think it's probably one of the safer ideas that you can have. Unless it's Big Japan, they're probably going to hit people's cars with their fucking light tubes. So I wouldn't recommend it if it's a Big Japan show. Yeah, you'll get someone thrown onto your windshield. <laughs> so, and then they're going to take the windshield as a weapon. Uh, coming up on Sunday, it is the official launch. Last, last month was episode zero. This is the official first episode of the long and winding Royal Road. So it is, uh, back to back days of WH Park here at postwrestling.com. Who is on deck to join you, uh, for the, the big kickoff of your, your big look back at the glory period of all Japan pro wrestling? Well, John, it, it's our good friend Scrump from the PWT cast. I, I wanted to get someone who um, isn't, you know, super familiar with the, you know, the company of that era, because uh, I kind of want this to be kind of uh, educational for the listeners who aren't familiar with the era. And I thought having guests, you know, talk about their experiences, experiences of watching All Japan for the first time w- would be, you know, help in educating people and make me maybe like be a good a gateway for, for them to check out not only the show, but also these matches. So Scrump's going to be on the show. He was a great guest. We had a great conversation. And we're going to look at the a match from the 1997 Real World Tag League. It's, you know, FMW's Hayabusa teaming with Michinoku Pro's Jinsei Shinzaki taking on the All Japan team of Mitsuhara Masawa and Jin Akiyama. This takes place from November 27th. 
1997, uh, day eight of the Tag League in Sapporo, Japan, at the Nakajima Sports Center. Attendance is about 4,000 uh, people. It, it's a it's a fun match. Actually, the whole run of Hayabusa and Shizaki, they have some like about three or four really fun matches in this tag league. And, th- and we picked this one to talk about on the first episode. And yeah, I, I'm excited. Like I'm also going to be on the PWC cast. I actually recorded with, with a scrump and his co-host stank. Uh, I can't believe I'm actually saying these nicknames on air. Uh, and that's going to be dropping uh, this coming Monday. So keep an eye out for that. Man, WH park doing the media rounds. So uh, man, you can get three days in a row of WH park. It's it's like it's WH week done. I, I don't know if, if people can handle it. I think I go on rants on. Like, I, I think long and winding road road is the only show I don't go on a rant on. I definitely went on a rant on on the PWD cast. Obviously, we have this this particular show. Um, but yeah, do you want me to go on a rant about Del Wilkes of Patriot? I know there was a request from Way about that. I was literally saving that for the final question. You read my <laughs> mind. The floor is yours because as I was watching Del Wilkes challenging Bret Hart at Ground Zero 1997, much like Master Watto, this was a character that just screamed, I need WH Park's opinion of. The floor is yours. Okay, well, this might surprise you, John. I don't actually have a problem with Del Wilkes, the Patriot. I, I thought it was a fine character um, when he showed up in WCW. How about his finisher, fine. the Uncle Slam? terrible name the name is terrible the move itself is not is not bad but you know the best thing like he was he was a decent mid carter in all japan in the 90s john but the best thing he was ever part of was his faction with johnny ace and kenna kobashi get and you know what get stands for john get lost for two of the three close it stands for global energetic tough All, all things you can check I, off the box, I guess, for for, uh, for for the three of them are global. Uh, I don't know if Kenta Kobashi was global at, at that particular time in his career. Um, but I guess with with the introduction of the Patriot and Johnny Ace, it made it a, a global faction. Um, energetic, um, certainly for some of those chop sequences. Yes. Uh, tough. I know Kenta Kobashi is very tough. Um uh, I guess, I mean, Johnny Ace survived WCW in the year 2000, and the Patriot was, well, the Patriot, so. As long as we're not talking about the Dark Patriot, Doug Gilbert, then, you know, that was shit. Like, Doug Wilkes was fine as a wrestler. His look was okay. It's, you know, patriotic, you know, American flag gimmick. It, it, it's it's fine for what it was. But, but Doug Gilbert as the Dark Patriot was absolute fucking shit. And honestly, like, uh, 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 you know, f- a fine idea at that time when they were really pushing the, the whole Hart Foundation in 97 that you got one pay-per-view match with Del Wilkes. And I thought Bret Hart did a pretty masterful job in that, in those 20 minutes. And yeah. That, and that's, I, that's pretty I, I much the extent. That's pretty much the extent of that run was that pay-per-view match. But there you go. Can I just, can I just say his tag team with Marcus Alexander Bagwell <laughs> was my, was my uh, third favorite tag team with uh, Bagwell. The number one is being, Bagwell's team with two cold Scorpio and number two is Vicious and Delicious with Scott Norton. Vicious and Delicious. Can't go wrong with those. <laughs> Can't go wrong. No. All right. Well, that's going to uh, wrap up this month's edition of Post Pro Res. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks and we'll talk about uh, whatever's going on in the world of uh, Japanese wrestling. New Japan is about to just hit the ground running now that they're back after the Osaka shows, they're going to be running uh, a New Japan Road Show, Sengoku Lord in Nagoya, and then uh, Summer Struggle. What, a, what an appropriate name for a show this year. Uh, and then they're just running tons of dates throughout the rest of July and into August. I'm just scrolling down here. It's just nonstop through mid-August. Yeah, it's it's a pretty busy schedule. But before we go, John, I I, I got some um, some information from from Way about the post Perez T-shirts. Oh yes, uh, yes. And I, I just want to thank people who who uh, bought the shirts recently. And these include uh, my two of my friends from Numazu, Bong and Emily, who now uh, teach English over in Saudi Arabia. They 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 got shirts. Thank you, Bong and Emily. Uh, Jose uh, Menkilis, uh, John Sino, uh, Sino Evil, uh, Chris uh, Mil. 
Nick Ilhaga. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. I, I apologize. Uh, hopefully I said it right. Uh, your man, Neil. He's not my man, Neil. He's your man, Neil. Uh, and Scott Torrance. Uh, thank you all for purchasing the Post Press t-shirt. I, I saw one of our, our listeners uh, put up, he, but he got his and he put it on. He put it on Instagram. It looks great. It, go take a look. Uh, John's, John's already like uh, put it on the Post Wrestling Instagram. And, and if you think, man, that looks good on that guy. It can be you. This could be you looking just as good on Instagram. So go buy the T-shirt, please. Yes, it's a it's a wonderful design by Robert Pearson, uh, who congratulations recently got yes. engaged. Broken news broken by Ariel Hawani of ESPN, by the way. Yes, I, I saw that on uh, Robert's uh, Facebook there, and I, I sent him a congratulations. I'm I'm hoping maybe uh, whenever they schedule the wedding, maybe some of us can attend it. Yeah, there's. Uh, I actually know I have quite a few people that are scheduled to get married next year, and I don't know what the what what the uh, the industry of uh, weddings is going to look like uh, next year because there's got to be some insane backlog from people that are probably not getting married this summer that had planned to or at least had to change plans. Well, it's a good thing you got married way before the pandemic, John. We we thought ahead. We 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 sat down. We we're like, you know what? This this is the time to do it. Um, because you know what? We we just don't know what could happen several years down the road. So, uh, we hope everyone is safe that is uh, listening to this. As we said at the beginning, wear a mask and just be courteous of others. That is our message to you. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks and chatting all the latest topics. And uh, maybe WH and I will put our heads together for uh. Some kind of theme that we can uh, dive into. I really like the the history of Noah we did on the on the last show. So maybe we can uh, come up with some idea if uh, the wrestling news is somehow slow. Although wrestling news doesn't typically uh, slow down during this whole period. No. Um, if not, maybe I can just go on another fifteen minute rant about Big Japan. Yeah, th- that you can death taxes, Big Japan rants, the things you can guarantee on in life and on this show. So to everyone, thank you for listening, and we will speak with you. Uh, well, WH will on Sunday for the long and winding Royal Road. Goodbye.